All right, guys, hey, uh, this is the first of three, a three-part lecture called The Origins of Progressivism and the Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, your book talks about progressivism, but one place where I think it really lacks is that it doesn't talk about the origins of progressivism, the, the intellectual and philosophical origins. Why did these people become reformers, progressives? Why did they try to transform the country in the ways that they did between about 1900 and 1920? Well, in the second year of the Civil War, the Merrill Act was passed, or the Morrill Act, pardon me, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, the Morrill Act. Sometimes it's called the College Land Grant Act, because what it did is set aside, Congress set aside 140 million acres of federal land specifically for the purpose of creating colleges to further the adult education of the American people in scientific areas and technological areas, and they were also interested in providing what we might today call a liberal arts education. So the result of this between 1870 and 18, pardon me, between 1870 and 1900 is that you have an extraordinarily large number of college graduates in the United States. Not extraordinary by our standards today, but if you compare 1870 to 1900 to the 30 years prior to that, it's just night and day. So by the time we get towards the end of the century, around 1900, when the progressive movement is going to begin, you've got this really large number of people, city dwellers, urbanites, okay, people in urban areas who are better educated than ever before. It's not the majority of people, but it's a lot more than ever before. City dwellers, better educated, they're almost all middle class. The progressive movement was a middle class phenomenon and they are fired up to transform the country, to change the country. They've got this sense of mastery, the sense that they can change anything, do anything, accomplish anything. Okay, so where did these ideas come from or what's the, the philosophical and intellectual foundation of progressivism? Well, certainly a big part of it is Christian humanism, but more importantly, in terms of the specifics of late 19th century America, you've got this character named Frederick W. Taylor, the father of scientific management. The Civil War led to a massive expansion of America's industrial sector, far more factories than ever before, far bigger than ever before, producing infinitely more stuff than ever before. Our industrial sector grew so quickly that it outgrew the ability to manage it properly. So Frederick W. Taylor came up with a set of protocols and principles and ways of, of better managing business scientifically. He not only transformed industry and the management of businesses in the United States, but also in Latin America and Europe. Um, sometimes scientific management is referred to as Taylorism, or it used to be referred to as Taylorism when people talked about him. Um, he was a, a revolutionary without even trying to be one, okay? But the thing is, the progressives going to college at the time that Taylorism was such a tremendous phenomenon, they, they learned about Frederick W. Taylor, they learned about scientific management. And they begin to ask themselves, they said, okay, look, if you've got a factory in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's got 500 or 6 or 800 or 1,000 people working in it, or 200 or 2,000, whatever, a factory is just a thing full of people. If you can apply the principles of scientific management to better managing a factory, then why can't you apply the principles of scientific management to the better organization and the more efficient management of a city? like Baltimore, Maryland. And if you can make a city run better, because a city, after all, is nothing more than a thing full of people, why not a state like Illinois? For example, any state, but I've got Illinois here. Because what is a state? It's a thing full of people. And if you can make the state of Illinois run better, why can't you make the country run better, the nation, the United States of America? Why can't we take Taylor's principles of scientific management, more efficient, more streamlined, more expeditious, more rational, more logical organization and management of things. And why can't we apply that to our country, reform the country? And some of these progressives even ask themselves, hey, if we can reform the factory, the city, the state, the country, then why not the world? Why not the world? There were some progressives that literally felt like they could change the world. Isn't that 
just ask yourself, isn't that kind of an American notion, the idea that we can influence the world, change the world? Well, this is the time, even slightly before this, when those kinds of, those ways of thinking begin to come into vogue. Okay, now the other thing that was important for the progressives was the writings of Thomas Jefferson. Between the 1810s and the 1870s, Thomas Jefferson was not all that fondly remembered by the people of the United States. In fact, it's likely that had they erected a Mount Rushmore in the mid-1800s, he might not even have been on it. In fact, the Jefferson Memorial was not built until 1943. I think if you stopped your average American on the street, offered him a hundred bucks and said, hey, name the six most important presidents in the history of the country, they probably mention all four of the guys on Mount Rushmore, Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and the other Roosevelt, and then they go, depending on their ideological perspective, Reagan or Kennedy, you know, it's hard to say, but I think overwhelmingly, certainly, people would name Jefferson, okay? But that was not the case before the 1870s. However, during the 1870s, the collected letters of Thomas Jefferson were published in like 27 volumes, two, three hundred thousand letters, okay? And maniac historians read every freaking one of those letters and they began to think through Jefferson and reassess Jefferson and try to make sense of Jefferson based on the words coming out of his own mouth, so to speak, or out of his own pen onto a piece of paper. The progressives, again, these college-educated, mostly men and women, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, going to college, they learned about Jefferson. They learned a lot about Jefferson. Jefferson was a big deal at that point. And they absorbed certain lessons of Jefferson's that they felt were the kind of the essential points that Jefferson had to make about, about uh, society, government, the economy. They came up with a batch of almost like moral lessons, you might say, or ethical lessons that they referred to as Jeffersonian fundamentalism, okay, or the fundamentals, the basics of Thomas Jefferson's thinking. Now, there's a lot more than just four things, but these things you see here, these are the four most important aspects of Jeffersonian fundamentalism for the progressives. Okay, so first off, too little government results in anarchy. Too much government results in tyranny. A good government finds the balance between the two. You've got to kind of find this teeter-totter spot between having way too much government, which overwhelms the liberties of the people with tyranny and oppression, and too little government, which results in lawlessness, chaos in the streets, anarchy. Okay, the progressives believed that Jefferson was right about this, that somewhere between those two extremes was the optimum good government. The role of good government must be expanded to ensure minimum standards of decency for its people. Jefferson argued that a good government would make sure that people were taken care of if they were in need, that they would be provided for if they had a genuine uh, problem in terms, you know, homelessness, not enough to eat, okay? What are, what, are the, what are the minimum standards of decency for the citizen of a country as wealthy as the United States? Look, what about right now? Roof over your head, food on the table three times a day, access to reasonably priced health care, a job. Well, you know, the, the standards were different then than they are now, but Jefferson's argument was if your government is a good government, it will ensure that there's minimum standards of decency guaranteed to all the citizens that it governs. And if the government doesn't have enough power to do that, then the government needs to be expanded so that it can do that. The progressives believed not that there was too much government in the late 1800s, but that there was too little good government. So they wanted to create more good government through good laws created and passed and enforced by good men. Okay, number three, competition in the marketplace is in the best interests of the people. Monopoly is not, okay? For Thomas Jefferson, monopoly, no bueno, okay? It's no good. Monopoly is no good. You need to have six or eight or 10 or 15 different companies or interests producing shoes, or clothes, or sewing machines, or eyeglasses, because then they're all going to have to compete with each other for a good, fair price, and people are not going to be gouged for unfair prices. Monopolistic business practices are bad for the people. 
Jefferson believed this. The progressives believed this. Last but not least, the excessive profits from big business or corporations must in part be redirected to benefit the public good, meaning if a company makes a gigabajillion dollars, godzillion dollars, however many millions or hundreds of millions, you know, there's got to be some percentage of that that the company, the corporation, the business interest then redirects to the benefit of the people. Build hospitals, build schools, build gymnasiums, youth centers, you know, uh, help vaccinate the children of the poor, establish libraries, something. You got richer than, than God because the people spent money, enormous amounts of money on your thing or your things, this stuff that you produce. Take some of that money that you made off of the people and redirect it to benefit the people. Okay? Thomas Jefferson died with a mountain of debt on his head and he lived beyond his means every year of his adult life, 50 years plus. Okay? And part of the reason for that was not just that he was a big spender and liked to buy expensive wines and this and that and whatever, but because he always, every year of his life, gave a lot of money to charities because he felt that that was part of his role in society as a man who was an elite, upper class, made a lot of money, made a lot of money, spent too much of it, always in debt, died in debt. But okay, let me have a little jot of water here. And let's continue. Here's a political cartoon that should give you a pretty good sense of Thomas Jefferson's centrality in terms of the thinking of the progressives. The biggest and wealthiest and most corrupt city in the United States around 1900 was New York City. And New York City's City Hall is a building called Tammany Hall. As you see this great big giant-sized tiger here, you can see in the stripes on its body the word Tammany, right? So here's this kind of predatory tiger representing the corruption of, this, of the city government in New York, this darkness at, at, the, at the heart of New York City. The tiger is stalking towards the White House. The storm clouds are gathered in the background and looming up as with the specter of kind of righteousness and this look on his face like, all right, buddy, let's go, right? You see the, the spirit of Jefferson here. And so Windsor McKay, the political cartoonist here, is posing a kind of question, that question being, you know, who's going to win when the struggle comes down to the progressive impulses of the federal government with Jefferson fundam Jeffersonian fundamentalism behind it or the tiger of Tammany, you know? Who's going to win this big battle? Well, ultimately it was kind of a draw. But anyway, again, the point of the cartoon is to suggest or to, to, to carry to further, um, you know, your sense that Jefferson was very, very important to the progressives. All right, now, a few more things in terms of Jefferson. Educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. Minimum standards of decency meant to Thomas Jefferson, among other things, education for the children of everyone, lower class, middle class, as well as the upper class. Most bad government has grown out of too much government. Jefferson, okay? This is a point where the philosophy of Jefferson did not jibe exactly with that, with that of the progressives. Jefferson always believed that the best government was that which had little power, so as to protect the liberties of the people from the potential tyranny of government grown too strong. But again, as I mentioned earlier, for the progressives, living more than a century later, the problem was that there was not enough good or effective government, so their agenda was to create more government and be sure that it was being operated by good, responsible men according to laws made by those same men. Okay. Now, again, who are these progressives? In the late 1800s, right towards the very, very end of the century, you have this group. They are educated, middle-class, urban reformers who are determined to fix what they thought was broken in American society. Not everything they did was 100% effective, but overall they radically transformed the United States and they were a terrific movement for positive change. But let's consider the term movement for a moment. Movement implies groups, collectives, masses of people, which raises a very provocative question that has concerned historians over the last few centuries. What is the primary engine of change in history? Movements or great men or women? Is it faceless masses of ordinary people calling up and inspired by religious beliefs or isms such as republicanism, abolitionism, nationalism, fascism, communism? 
Or is it charismatic leaders, male or female, who, chosen by destiny, step onto the stage of history to help shape and articulate the thoughts and feelings of the people, thereby setting in motion, for good or ill, tremendous forces for change? Historians have been arguing about this for generations, and there will never be one definitive answer. But let me just say this for now. The progressive movement would not have been as wildly successful as it was without the right kind of president in office, one that was sympathetic to most of their ideas and efforts. And that president, Theodore Roosevelt, could not have been as successful a president as he was were it not for the great movement of Americans at the turn of the century who had dedicated themselves to the great work of reforming the country. Okay, I'm going to stop now and we're going to pick up with part two in the next video.